You know, I truly enjoyed the hell out of my most recent playthrough of Final Fantasy X. I'm sure we've all been there where we replay an old favourite and it's just not quite as good as you remember it. Or it starts to lose its shine after having been played so many times through the years. But nope, that was not the case for FF10. I find it a good deal harder to get into games nowadays compared to how I used to be when I was younger. Of course, tastes develop as we get older and as we're exposed to more and more different games. But it's really nice to have a few titles we can always go back to even after we've sunk hundreds of hours into them over the years. For me, a few examples of such games are Sunless Sea, Bloodborne, Chegger's Party Quiz, Darkest Dungeon, and yes, Final Fantasy X. In my most recent playthrough, I mostly only did the critical story content, with some exceptions. This was mainly done for time and because I was eager to start putting together the video instead of just playing the game for endless hours. Now though, with it being a good few weeks later, I thought it would be fun to go back and do a bit more of the endgame stuff. To be specific, I want to capture 10 of every monster in the game. This is something I've done several times on previous playthroughs, and though it is very grindy, it's also fun and satisfying because of how great FF10's vibes are. So I thought, why not make another video about the game, with this one showing my journey to capture 10 of every dingo, 10 of every imp, of every bomb, of every zoo, and even 10 of these mother For anyone wondering what the hell I'm even talking about, around 60-70% to of the way into the game you reach a large open plain called the Calm Lands. It's an important area, being directly connected to Makalania Woods, the Cavern of the Stolen Faith, Mount Gagazet, and Ramium Temple, and it's also where you can do those fun chokeable minigames that no one ever got frustrated at and everyone loves. Tucked away discreetly over at the far eastern side of the Calm Lands, however, is a passage leading to the Monster Arena. The Monster Arena is 100% optional. In fact, I'd bet there's a lot of players that have played through the whole game not even knowing it was there. When you first visit the place, you'll be limited in what you can actually do here, but you can purchase unique weapons which have the capture ability. One of the only abilities you can't customise onto a weapon yourself. These weapons can only be bought here by this man, who we'll be visiting a lot. See, with these weapons we can actually capture enemies we encounter out in the field, as long as the killing blow is dealt by someone with a capture weapon. The killing blow can't be dealt by a magic attack, an Aeon or an Overdrive, it has to be with a physical attack. Skills are fine like Mug or Quick Hit, just no magic. This immediately puts Lulu out of the equation for me, because 1. she only does about 5 damage per attack, and 2. her attack animation, although cute, takes forever, and considering I'm going to be attacking a hell of a lot here, not ideal. As such, I'll only really be using Tidus, Waka and Orin for capturing monsters, or fiends if you will. I'm just going to keep calling them monsters though. You'll know you were successful at capturing a monster because that little message up top will appear, but if you've already caught 10 of a particular monster, you'll get a different message telling you that you've exceeded the maximum capture limit for that monster. This doesn't come with any negative effects or anything, it's just there to let you know that you won't get any additional benefits for capturing any more of that monster. Unfortunately, there's no way to check how many of each monster you've actually caught while out in the field, and this ends up being a massive pain in the arse. It's really easy to lose count, so you might have already caught 10 of a rare monster and not be aware of it because the message to inform you that you've exceeded the maximum capture amount doesn't appear when you've caught 10. It appears when you catch more than 10. Literally, the only way to check how many of a particular monster you've caught is by getting back on the airship, teleporting back to the calm lands, hiring a chocobo, riding it to the monster arena, talking to the dude, and checking the entry for that monster in the menu. If it's at 10, great, you've achieved your goals. If it's less than 10, back you go to keep grinding. Pen and paper are handy here to keep tallies of how many of each area's monsters you've caught, but as we'll see, some enemies are very rare. Thus, if you've caught 10 of them, you don't want to be fanning around catching additional ones when you don't need to. Also, must mention that any enemies from story related areas which can't be returned to, like Home or Via Purifico, are not considered for the monster arena. I guess I should now explain the actual point of all this. See, capturing a monster means you can fight it whenever you like from the monster arena. 
So if there's a specific enemy you want to farm, you can just fight it directly instead of hoping you run into it whilst out in the field. You can fight any enemy as many times as you want by the way, as long as you've caught at least one of it, it just costs a bit of money each time, with the cost getting higher if you want to fight more powerful monsters. So that's cool and all, but something even cooler is that if you catch enough monsters, you start unlocking the option to fight new, super powerful monster arena creations. These enemies are cool as hell and very challenging, but fight them too early on in the game and you will get absolutely leveled. Even the easiest monster arena creation is way harder than the hardest main story boss. There are three categories of monster arena creations. Area conquest monsters, which unlock when you capture at least one of each enemy type at a specific location. Then there are species conquest monsters, which unlock when you capture a certain number of different monsters belonging to the same species, e.g. wolves or elementals. And lastly, there are original monster arena creations. These unlock by fulfilling various other conditions, such as capturing one of every type of monster in the game, capturing two of every underwater type creature, and then the one most relevant to this video, capturing 10 of every type of enemy in the game. Doing this unlocks the strongest of all Monster Arena creations, Nemesis. But this video isn't about fighting the actual creations, that'll be for another video. Nope, this video is just about my journey in capturing 10 of every monsters. I just thought it'd be a fun thing to make, providing a little bit of commentary at each area. The last thing I'll say before we get onto the meat of the matter is that each time you unlock a Monster Arena creation, you're also gifted with an absolute shit ton of great items. The specific item depends on which new creation you've unlocked, but this game throws silly numbers of items at you, and some of them are super useful. One of the best rewards is what you get for capturing 5 of every enemy in the game, netting you 99 Dark Matters, which can be used to customise the ribbon passive onto someone's armour. Literally the only other way to get Dark Matters is as a random rare drop for fighting monster arena creations. So yeah, pretty sick when you get 99 of them. There's tons of other incredible items as well, although sometimes the game will just throw 99 shit items at you that you'll probably never use, but still, thank you. Now that I've explained the capture mechanics, let's finally crack on with it. I'm going to keep this pretty simple and just start from the easiest area in the game, which is Sunny Beside, to the hardest area in the game at the end, the dark and dangerous Omega Dungeon. Also, even though rewards are often unlocked after only capturing one of each enemy from an area, or from say four of each enemy from a particular species, I'll just be going from area to area, capturing 10 of every enemy each time, returning to the arena periodically to collect any and all rewards. Now let's crack on with it, finally! Ah, Besaid. I love Besaid. Such a happy place and by far the easiest area to capture 10 of every monster in. This is because there's literally only three enemy types here. The Dingo, the Condor and the Water Fun. Needless to say, everything's a one hit kill here. And this will also be the case for most areas up until we get to, say, Mount Gagazet and beyond. There are no rare monsters in Besaid, so I reached the capture limit for all of them at around about the same time. Now there is actually a fourth enemy which appears in Besaid, but you only actually ever see it once as part of the early game combat tutorial where you're encouraged to summon an Aeon to fight a Garuda. We don't need to worry about that enemy for the monster arena though because it's a one-off at Besaid and you'll never see it again. To be honest, nothing else much to say about this place really. It's a lovely place to look at, so I just wander up and down and up and down and up and down until we're done. Just please don't go anywhere near the actual village or else. Returning to our dad at the monster arena, here unlocks the Stratio Avis monster and nets us 99 stamina tonics, which can be used to double the max HP of your entire party in battle. Pretty good. Next up, we've got Kilika, and it's another easy one. I pass through the village and into the woods and do my usual aimless running around routine. Like we said, there's not many different enemies to find here, only four. You have the Dynonix, Yellow Element, Ragora, and Killer Bee. Kilika is the first area where you actually get a bit of a taste of our first rare monster, with the Ragora appearing a bit less frequently than the other three. I mean, you're not going to be grinding here for hours, praying that one appears or anything, but they will probably be the last monster here to reach the capture limit. 
Besaid and Kilika are really nice areas to start off with, and it won't take long before you catch up 10 of everything. Returning back to our uncle at the Monster Arena unlocks the Marlboro Menace, and we get 99 Poison Fangs for our troubles. These items aren't particularly useful at this point in the game, but thanks anyway. Okay, the easy stuff is out of the way. Besaid had 3 enemy types and Killika had 4. And next up is Mehen High Road, which presumably has 5 types? Maybe? Hmm? No, it has 8. And this area is a good deal larger than the other two. There's a wide range of different enemies at Mehen. You've got the Mehen Fang, the Aperia, the Floating Eye, White Element, Raldo, Dual Horn, and Vuvva. Down on the. <laughs> Down on the old road zone of the area, you'll also find Thunderflans, however these are actually classed as a Mushroom Rock Road monster, not a Mehen one. None of the enemies in Mehen are particularly rare and so you'll be reaching the capture limits for a bunch of them at around about the same time. It also depends on where you actually are though. I found dual horns to be not too common in the first zone of the high road, but they appeared a bunch more in the zone after Ren's travel agency. Bombs were also kind of sparse for me before I got here, but then I saw tons of them, often in groups of two or three. In fact, I'm sick of the bloody sight of bombs now, to be honest. It didn't take me terribly long to capture 10 of everything on the high road, but I still had a couple of critters to wrangle on the old road, the Aperia and the Vuvre. These chaps only appear in the lower part of Mehen, but once you get here, they ain't too rare. As I mentioned, Thunderflans aren't technically a Mehen monster, but I caught 10 of them while I was here, because why not? Though Mehen had more monster types than the previous two areas put together, it really wasn't too bad. Nothing here is particularly rare. Travelling back to your dad at the Monster Arena unlocks the Kotos creation and gets us 99 Soul Springs. These are shit and you probably won't ever use them. Next up on the agenda is Mushroom Rock Road. There's another good selection of monsters to capture here, but nothing too crazy. We have the Thunderflan, the Gandarua, Red Element, Raptor, Lamashtu, Fungwar, and lastly the Majestic Garuda. We'll be seeing plenty of Thunderflans here, but they're handled already, so fuck off. As for the rest of them, we don't have any rare game at Mushroom Rock. Spawn rates for some monsters do seem to differ depending on whether you're in the first zone or the second though. I didn't actually see any Garudas for a while until I reached the second zone down from the elevator. Then they started appearing a bunch. And the Lamash 2 only really appeared in the first zone of the map. Mushroom Rock Road really wasn't so bad though, all in all. We're still in the relatively painless and uneventful phase of the journey though. Returning back to our wife at the Monster Arena unlocks the cool Regina creation. We're also rewarded with 99 Candles of Life, an item which can be used to cast Doom on an enemy. Again, pretty much useless. Thanks. Next up, Josie High Road. The Josie High Road category at the Monster Arena is kind of interesting in that it also encompasses the Moonflow area. These two field areas share most of the same monsters. Again, the number of different monsters to be caught here is 7. We've got the Basilisk, the Simurg, Bitebug, Garm, Snowflan, Bunyip, and Ochu. While the first six enemies there all appear on the Jose High Road, Ochu can only be picked up at the moon floor. Furthermore, a few enemies from Mushroom Rock Road also appear in the general Jose High Road area. Most of the monsters here aren't much of an issue to capture, with the exception of the Simurg. I actually have pretty rough memories of our fine feathered friend here from back in the day. I remember it being a big pain in the arse to capture ten of them long after I'd maxed out all the other enemies. Thankfully, it really didn't appear too rarely for me here, so I guess I just got lucky. I was initially a bit confused when I returned back to my wife's boyfriend at the Monster Arena and wasn't immediately awarded with a new creation or any items. Then I remembered that I still had to nail Ochu, Lord of the Moonflow. For our troubles, we unlocked the Jormungand creation and 99 petrified grenades. Petrify grenades are actually super powerful and can just straight up insta-kill any enemies who lack immunity to stone, which is most of them. Nice.
My last port of call for the day was the Thunder Plains. This place is a bit spicier due to having to constantly deal with lightning bolts, but they don't deal any damage, so they're only really a minor annoyance. Like Meehan Road, there are eight different fiends in total which require capturing at the Thunder Plains. The Melusine, Larva, Gold Element, Iron Giant, Cactuar, Kusariku, Bwer, and Eruj. Most of these enemies can be found anywhere in the Thunder Plains, with two exceptions. Iron Giants will only appear in the Northern Zone, with none appearing to the South. Once you enter the North though, they're common enough and won't take too long to max out. Cactuars are a bit different though, as you literally never see a single one until you start activating the glowing Cactuar stones present throughout the Thunder Plains. The more stones you've activated, the more Cactuars can appear in battle at any one time, making them pretty damn easy to max out once you've gone through that whole rigmarole. Just be careful and don't talk to that ominous stranger under the Lightning Tower in the Northern Zone, unless you want to get fucked up by Dark Ixion. All in all, Thunder Plains also ain't so bad. There's a lot of enemies here and the constant lightning's a bit annoying, but there aren't any particularly rare monsters here. And trust me, the particularly rare monsters are where the pain is at. Returning back to former Labour Prime Minister Gordon Brown unlocks the Cactuar King, and we get 99 Chocobo Wings, which is a really good reward. These can be used to cast haste on the whole party, or you can use 80 of them to customise auto haste onto someone's gear, one of the best passive armour abilities in the game. Ah, uh, Makalania Woods. Probably the most beautiful area in the game, and a really nice one to roam around in. It's a pretty damn big place too though, and so appropriately we've got a lot of different monsters to catch. The most of any area up until this point. Makalania boasts 10 different enemy types. The Igweon, Blue Element, Chimera, Wasp, Evil Eye, Ice Flan, Marusu, Mafdet, Xyphos, and Snow Wolf. While most of these enemies can be found anywhere within the woods zone of the area, the snow flu, snow flu, <laughs> the snow wolf, evil eye, ice flan, and mafdet only appear around the frozen, fuck's sake, only appear around the frozen lake section leading up to Makalania Temple. Although there are a lot of different enemy types here, none are too excruciatingly rare. I'd say the Xyphos is probably the rarest, but it does show up fairly regularly, so nothing too rough. Something that I ended up finding surprisingly useful was the Butterfly minigame. See, if you want to go for Kamari's Saturn Sigil for his Celestial Weapon, you've got to do the Butterfly minigame in Makalania Woods. They're fucking awful. Honestly, I haven't done them in years, but I remember hating them even more than having to dodge 200 lightning strikes in the Thunder Plains. The butterfly minigames are essentially a time trial through parts of the woods, but if you touch a red butterfly on your way, you're forced into a battle and you also lose some time. The main issue for me was that it's really difficult to manoeuvre past the butterflies because of the perspective, and sometimes even though you're sure you didn't touch one, it turns out you actually did touch it, and the run's done for. Also if you fail, you just have to wait for the timer to run down before being able to try again, making it all the more tedious. Ugh. Anyway, this is actually a good thing here. By initiating the minigame and deliberately touching every red butterfly in sight, you can get into battles more quickly than the encounter rate would normally allow for, speeding things up a bit. After maxing out everything in the woods, it's time to head to the frozen lake area to capture 10 snow flues, evil eyes, marusus and ice flans. Nothing too challenging here, so when we're done, Time to head back to the Lord of all fevers and plagues, unlocking access to the Espada creation and getting 60 Shining Gems. Using one of these on an enemy casts the Flare spell, dealing some decent damage. Or you could also use 16 of them to imbue a weapon with the magic counter ability. Yeah, pretty good. We've also got another nice surprise here, unlocking the Mars Sigil for Orin. I actually forgot about this one, but you get it by unlocking at least 10 different area or species creations. I'll drink to that. Okay, now here is where things get a bit more shitty. Next destination is Beaconel Desert, the largest field area in the game, I think. 
Despite its size, however, there aren't actually a huge range of different monsters here. In fact, you've only got six to worry about. The Sand Wolf, Alcyone, Zoo, Sandworm, Bushusu, and of course, the thorn in my side, the Cactuar. As far as the Sand Wolf, Alcyone, and Mishusu go, they're common as hell and can be found all over Beacon Hill. The zoo and the enormous sand one are a tad more elusive, however. In the central zone of Beacon Hill, there's actually a sign written in Albed warning that stronger fiends can be found on the left hand path and weaker fiends to the right. Of course, the left hand path is the one we're interested in, and it doesn't take too long to rack up plenty of sand one catchers here. These things are so big, I always found it funny to use Orin's shooting star on them and watch as they fly out of orbit. The main prick of Beacon Hill Desert, however, is the bloody Cactuar, because they're damn rare. As far as I'm aware, they can appear pretty much anywhere on Beacon Hill, but I seem to have the most success running around near the Cactuar village section, which makes sense, I guess. Cactuars aren't really the rarest enemy in the game, but they are rare, and it took more than a while to capture 10 of the fuckers. But capture them I did. Turning back to Trash Can Man unlocks the Abyss Worm creation and 99 Shadow Gems. Tossing a Shadow Gem at an enemy casts the Demi spell on them. A big whoop, it's rubbish. As well as the Beacon Hill area creation, we also unlock our first couple of species creations. This will start happening more now that we're capturing more and more stuff from around Spira. We unlock the Fafnir and Terex species creations, also rewarding us with 99 purifying salts and 99 Mega Phoenix. Okay then, that's the kid stuff really over now because every area from here on has a lot more enemies. Gone are the days of three or four different enemy types, like in Besaid and Kilika, and we'll also be on the hunt for some much rarer enemy types. Also, I decided I was just going to finish up this day and absolutely power through all five remaining areas. Now, we have the Clanlands, home to nine different enemy types to be captured. Something to mention first is that I already caught a bunch of different monsters in this area back in my original playthrough last month. This is also the case for Mount Gagazet and Inside Sin. I'll still have plenty of stuff to hunt down through those areas, but I will be starting at a bit of an advantage. The fiends to be found in the Calm Lands are the Nebaros, Flameflan, Shred, Skull, Ogre, Chimera Brain, Kuril, Malboro and Anaconda. Now that's a lot of enemies and there's some pretty damn rare ones here. But the clan lands are where I realised how significantly different spawn rates could be for different enemy types, depending on which section you're running around in, even within the one open area. The Nebaros, Flameflan, Shred and Skull are super common and very easy to max out. On the other hand, the others can be much rarer. At first I mainly wandered around in the east, near the Monster Arena entrance, and I did encounter a few on a Condor, Chimera Brains and Kurals, but not many at all. So I decided to roam around a bit to see if the spawn rates would vary from section to section. See the calm lands are quite unique in that although it's one large area, it's all actually the one zone, there are no loading screens in between. And so I wasn't sure if the encounter rates for different monsters might be constant regardless of location within the zone, but no they vary a lot. When I started hanging around to the northwest, I had bloody Malboros, Ogres and Chimeras up the wazoo. The monster I was particularly worried about was the Ogre, because I remember this enemy being really, really rare. And indeed, they are the rarest enemy in the Clanlands if you're running around in the wrong part of the map. Thankfully, this time they did not give me too much trouble, and so after an hour or so, I'd caught 10 of everything in the Clanlands. It was only a hop, skip and a jump back to the monster arena from here, and touching base with Peanut Arbuckle unlocks three species creations, Fenrir, Hornet and Jumboflan. We're also gifted with 99 chocobo feathers, 60 mana tonics and 60 twin stars. No area creation rewards here because I'd already unlocked them back in my original playthrough. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Next up is one which every monster hunter dreads, and that's for one main reason. The Tonbury. Folks, it's the cavern of the stolen faith. We've got the Neat Hog, Dark Element, Valaha, Epage, Ghost, Yowie, Imp, Thorn, and yes, the notorious, notorious Tonbury. Although there are areas ahead with much more different enemies, harder ones too, this is the area I always get intimidated by. Some of the monsters here aren't particularly problematic, like the Nadehog, Yowie, Imp and Thorn, but the Dark Element, Epage and Valaha can be stubbornly elusive. It's the Tornbury which is the real menace though, because in my experience, this is the single rarest enemy in the game. Don't get me wrong, it's not insanely rare to the point where you'll be running around for hours for encountering a single one, but it really can take a while to get 10 of them. It's a bit of a thrill when a battle starts up and you actually see one, then you remember that you actually need 10 of the fucking things. I definitely experienced varying encounter rates for different enemies while wandering around the cavern, but I'm still not really sure if it matters where you are for Tomboreys. They seem really rare regardless of where I was. I will confess though that although it took a while, I've had much harder times hunting these guys in the past. I even got two of them in a row at one point, so I shan't complain over much. But I was glad as hell once I could put this place behind me. Returning back to the big kahuna unlocks the Don Tonbury creation, also getting us 40 silver hourglass. We also unlock the species creations for horned beasts, mushrooms and imps, those being the Juggernaut, Sleep Sprout and Vedatu rewarding us with 99 light curtains, 99 healing springs and 99 mana springs. Furthermore, we also unlock an original monster arena creation, the Thuban, also getting us 99 gambler spirits. What the hell is a gambler spirit? How would that even work? It was a busy day for me and so next stop was Mount Gagazet. Like the Clamlands, I'd already caught a bunch of enemies here from this area previously, but still had a ways to go, and so I got started. There are loads of enemies at Mount Gagazet, including water-based ones, and also a couple from the Cavern of the Stolen Faith. There's the Bandersnatch, Bashura, Grat, Grenade, Mandragora, Grendel, Aramin, Behemoth, Darkflan, Akalos, Splasher and Mailspike, and also the Imp and Neathog, which we already just caught 10 of. Gagazet is comprised of two large zones, the snowy mountain pass and the caves, with different enemies residing at each area. The mountain pass zone is quite long, but none of the enemies here are too rare. You'll see tons of Bashura, grenades and grats here. The larger and more intimidating monsters are to be found in the caves, like the Behemoth, Darkflan and Mandragora. I found the Mandragora in particular to be quite elusive here, the Splasher, Mail Spike and Akalos were very easy to max out because they're the only enemies here which appear in the water, making them easy as hell to round up. Although Gagazet has the highest number of enemies of any area so far, thankfully none of them are all that rare, certainly not like the Tonbury or the Cactuar, and so it didn't take me super long to get 10 of everything. I should mention that although Xanarkin lies ahead of Mount Gagazet, it's not taken into consideration for the Monster Arena because the only enemies there are Machina ones and undead warriors, which cannot be caught. Anywho, returning back to <coughs> unlocks absolutely nothing, because I already did the area in Conquest on my original playthrough, so the Gagazet creation, the Katobo Pass, is already unlocked. The reward, which I already have, is the Blossom Crown, which is an item required to unlock the Magus Sisters, which I already have. Folks, we're on the last stretch now. Only two areas to go, Inside Sin and the Omega Ruins. Both these dungeons have a lot of different enemies and, for the first time, some enemies here are actually dangerous to us, whereas everything up until this point has pretty much been a cakewalk. I mean, Tidus, Waka and Orin can still flatten most monsters here, but I do have to stay on my toes now. As for Inside Sin, once again I already caught a decent number of enemies here before on my original playthrough, so again I got a good head start here, which is nice. Sin is host to 9 different monster types, the X-Ray, the Monolith, 
Adam and Toys, Barbatos, Behemoth King, Great Marlboro, Wraith, and both variants of Gemini. The Aramin monster from Mount Dagazet also appears here, but we've already got 10 of them, so who cares? As you can see, there's a whole bunch of big beefy beasts inside Sin. Gone are the days of the Condor. Gone are the days of the Humble Wasp. Gone are the days. Instead, we've got to start capturing bigger, more intimidating monsters that can actually do some damage. Enemies like the Demonolith can easily cause a game over unless you come prepared with at least one person with stoneproof armour. And the less said about the Great Marlboro's bad breath attack, the better. Luckily, nothing in Sin is too rare, but it can take a while to get 10 of everything, simply because we're not just one hit killing every monster now. Enemies like the Barbatos have 95,000 HP, and the Great Marlboro has 64,000. There are two main zones within Sin, each inhabited by different enemies. The X-Ray, Adamantoys, Behemoth King and Gemini are most common in this first watery zone. The Gemini is a particularly interesting enemy because even though both these guys have the exact same name, they're technically different monsters with slightly different hats. And so you've got to capture 10 of each of them. Thankfully they always appear together and so getting 10 of both of them really isn't too rough. The second zone comprised of strange shifting ruins are where the tougher monsters reside. Again, nothing here is overly rare, but these monsters here have some of the highest HP pools of any other area, even the Omega Ruins. Although the Great Marlboros here can easily cause party wipes via Bad Breath, you almost always get the first hit, and so a lot of the time you can actually kill them before they have a chance to do anything. This is in stark contrast to the Great Marlboros found in the Omega Ruins, which always get ambushes on your party, nearly always starting off the fight with Bad Breath. A bunch of enemies inside Sin actually also appear in the Omega Ruins, and so because I knew I was going there next, I skipped out of there before I can get my 10th the Monolith, knowing I could just pick one up later. And that, my friends, is Sin. It wasn't so bad for me here due to me already having had a head start, but yeah, it took quite a while. Returning back to <coughs> unlocks the species creation for finding enough Iron Giant type enemies, which also gets us 60 mana tablets. We do not get the Area Conquest reward for Sentho because I'd already gotten that one before, but it's the Abaddon creation. Here we go! What is this place? 700 years ago, a monk who defied the teachings was sentenced here. That's right, people. Just one place left one final area to capture 10 of everything in. Once we max out everything here, we're done. 10 of everything. Unfortunately, the final area happens to be the Omega Ruins, and there are a ton of different enemies to find here. 10 to be precise, but a bunch from inside Sin also appear here. The Omega Ruins has the Master Tonbury, the Black Element, the Halma, Spirit, Meishe, Varuna, Master Kurl, Zorus, Floating Death, and Purobros. Fuck. Puroboros. Unfortunately, there's some pretty rare stuff here, with the sheer number of possible encounters making their appearance all the more infrequent. The Omega Runes is also a really big place, and I did wander around and explore a bunch, but I'm really not too sure if the encounter rate for different enemies varied depending on where I actually roamed. Just didn't notice too much of a difference and so most of the time I just ran around real close to the safe sphere. See, the Omega Runes is even more dangerous than Inside Sin. There's a few monsters here you really have to watch out for, especially the Great Marlboro and the Demonoliths, with the former always getting an ambush on your party, and the latter now appearing in groups of two instead of on their own. The most common enemy encounter in this entire dungeon is the one with a Zorus and a chest. Opening the chest might get you a reward, but most of the time it yields a mimic. These things can't be caught through and so are useless to us here. A lot of the other enemies here like black elements, halmas and spirits aren't super rare but nor are they too common. You could easily go a damn while without seeing any of them and then catch six in the space of 10 minutes. Puroboros aren't very common, however when they do appear you'll always see them in groups of three, so not too bad. But there are two enemies in particular which always cause me 
great frustration. Those are the Master Tonbury, of course it's another fucking Tonbury, and the Varuna. It'll take a while to capture 10 of even the regular enemies here, but it can take hours to get 10 Master Tonberries and 10 Varunas. They're just really rare. I mean, I wouldn't say either of them are rare as the regular Tonbury from the Cavern of the Stolen Faith, but collectively, they'll take longer to get 10 each of. It took so long that I was getting a bit fatigued, and so before I'd maxed out everything, paid a visit to our old friend, just to see what new stuff I'd unlocked. We unlocked the area creation monster for the Omega Ruins, which is the Vorbin, also getting a 60 designer wallets. That's the last of the area creations, and I also unlocked every single remaining species creation while I was here. I'll be honest, I unlocked loads of stuff, so much so that I can't actually be bothered listing them all. I just don't want to. Anyways, I wasn't done yet, still needing 5 Master Tonberets and 4 Varunas. Ugh. And so yes, I returned back to the ruins and ran around and around, gradually getting closer and closer to maxing out everything, until I caught all the Varunas I needed, only requiring one more Master Tonberry. And when I found that last fucking Tonberry, I wrecked his arse! And I had done it. I'd captured 10 of everything, finally. And it only took about uh, 13 hours. Jesus. But now that I had everything I needed, I returned back to our friend at the Monster Arena to unlock the final creation, as well as my final reward. Uh, what now? Yeah, it turns out I'd forgotten some relevant information here. To actually unlock the final monster arena creation, Nemesis, not only must you capture 10 of every monster in the game, you also have to defeat every single creation at the arena. Folks, I'll be honest, my characters are nowhere near prepared for that at this point. But although I didn't get my reward, I'd still technically caught everything, and for now, I was happy with that. Getting strong enough to beat everything at the arena is a big undertaking, and it'll require a lot of preparation, strategy, and grinding. So I guess that's the plan for my next FF10 video. I really did enjoy going back to FF10 for this challenge, and although it did get a little bit tedious at times, it was a fun thing to do while listening to podcasts and stuff. To anyone still watching at this point, I hope you enjoyed the video, and as always, cheers for watching.